I am, we are recording um, the session this morning. So um, if uh, just for your, um, your benefit, um, if you, uh, if you want to, you can get people to um, look at it again on the website. We're hoping to publish um, the conference on the website. Um, but before we really get going, and I, I will invite Bishop Rose in a moment just to speak to us and welcome us to the conference. Um, but before we do that, just a bit of housekeeping right at the start. So if you bear with me while I find my mouse and share my screen. So you should all be able to now see the Safeguarding Conference. If I could have some thumbs up just from some folk to tell me. Right, great. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome to our conference um, this year. Very different from the last time we all got together. But I'm pleased to say that actually um, the change in um, configuration has allowed us to enable more people to join. So we've got about 200 people joining us this morning, which is really good. Um, just a bit of housekeeping at the start. Um, as I said before, please keep yourself, um, if you're familiar with Zoom, please use speaker view and not gallery view because that will enable you to see the speakers as well as their presentation. I have muted you all um, for the start. Um, speakers, you will need to unmute yourselves when it's your turn to speak. Um, but if you can keep yourselves muted, that would be really helpful. It just means that if you have a cough or the dog barks or the doorbell goes not the rest of us don't hear that so that'd be really helpful um, you can um, feel free to turn your camera off if you want as well it's it's really up to you for this part but we will be using the breakout rooms so you will need to turn your microphones back on and your cameras back on for that portion um, throughout the conference if you've got any questions um, can you um, feel free to use the chat function for the questions and can you put them in capital letters um, we won't feel like you're shouting at us it just helps us to identify what's general chat and people saying hello and that's okay to do um, if you if you wanted to do that um, but also for us to kind of pull out any questions that are coming through um, if you've got a nickname like user one two three if you're able and capable please use your your name or a nickname that you want to um, and um, I, without further ado, I think I'm ready to hand over to Bishop Rose. So, uh, oh, sorry, one last thing. Um, just you might want to know what's going on today, the programme. That's an important part, isn't it? So um, we've got Bishop Rose speaking to us about half past nine. Paul Brightwell's bringing us his presentation on the elephant in the room about safeguarding. At 10 o'clock, we'll go into our breakout rooms for discussion and a coffee break. So that'll be combined. We'll reconvene at 10.45 um, and any questions that arise out of Paul's presentation and your breakout rooms will address at that point. Um, at 10.55 there'll be a safeguarding team update and then at 11.15 or thereabouts um, Katie Harper, our new trainer, is going to be speaking on safeguarding and the online challenge and we hope to finish um, shortly after 12.15 between or no later than half 12 anyway. So that's how this morning is going to run. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to quickly find Bishop Rose uh, here and then she is going to welcome us to the conference. I'm here. Oh, thank you, Rose. So go on, over to you. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I hope it is a beautiful morning where you are. I'm looking out my window and although the sky is grey, um, there is still for me a real sense that this is the world that God has created and we are part of it and we have chosen today to be together specifically for this uh, annual safeguarding conference. So I want to say thank you for prioritizing this in your diaries. I'm sure there are lots of other things that you could have been doing and calling for your attention, but you have chosen, and I use that words um, with much emphasis, you have chosen to be here. And I believe if you have chosen to be here, it is because uh, you believe that this is uh, an, important, uh, uh, an important time in our lives uh, together to do this kind of reflection. So I wonder, 
when we think of safeguarding, what comes to mind? I'm just going to throw up some words. Uh, um, uh, victims, survivors, protection of vulnerable people, father knows best, lack of trust, complaints, whistleblower, mother knows best, child sexual abuse, spiritual grooming, indecent images, uh, inadequate response by the church, a place where abusers can hide, bishops, priests, lay leaders, using pastoral support to enable sexual assault, cultures of clericalism and deference to power. What comes to your mind when you think of that word, safeguarding? I wonder, there's a beautiful passage of scripture, which I know only too well. Let, and I hope we all know, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The sense of imitating Christ. And also that passage of scripture, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world. When did these two passages give way to that list that I mentioned before? I, I want to suggest to us that safeguarding seemed to have exploded on our screens and in our church life in the last few, I don't know, should I say 20, 15, 20 years, it has exploded in a big way. And even more recently, the, the need for us to have safeguarding advisors and, 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 and safeguarding um, individuals in our parishes, in our diocese, nationally. Is it something that has only happened recently? Or is it something that has always been with us? The reality is that there has been a need long before it exploded on our screens and became physically there in our mind's eyes. And some of us will be grumbling because this has added huge amounts financially to the diocese cost. And some of us might be thinking, do we really need to be paying all that money? Do we really need to? Every time we ask, do we really need to? Perhaps we might like to remind ourselves of the carnage that a lack of safeguarding has costed to those in our midst. Notice I am not saying what it has costed to the life of the church. I am talking about the cost in the life of the community, the people around us that we are meant to serve, the people around us that we are meant to care for, and absolutely the people around us that we are meant to love unconditionally. And so if we are failing to love unconditionally, if we are failing to care unconditionally, in particular for those who are most vulnerable in our society, and that of course is not just children, but they are adults too, sometimes the very elderly, but all those who are vulnerable, if we are not serving them, then we may as well shut up shop and go home. And I want to say also that we're not just talking about sexual abuse because that easily comes to mind and, and we know the big stories and the big headlines about the bishops or the priest or the lay leaders that flags up as soon as we hear and we think we hold our hands up, horror, horror. 
but actually for us to understand that sometimes the taboos that we have around the sexuality that disables us from speaking to one another openly about who we are and what's happening in our heads contributes to this. But as I said, we're not just talking about that kind of abuse. We're also talking about bullying abuse. And I want to say that since I have been part of the life of the church as an adult, that has been a feature that I have seen. There is no reason for us, not even the reason to say, I want you to know God, for us to beat this into someone else. Not even the reason to say, I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to be sinning and, and you're sinning, so I'm going to beat you over the head and you have got to accept my own personal theological view. Oh no. So my brothers and sisters, thank you for being here this morning. And it is my prayer and my hope uh, that as we get into the day, uh, this, this conference, that we will begin to be pointed to what are the questions we need to be asking? What are the things that we need to be doing? Where do we need to be looking? When do we need to say to our fellow congregants, this behavior, is unacceptable. The way you speak to your brother and sister is unacceptable. And we will not hide behind the fact that you are a priest or that you are a lay reader or you are the best um, financial giver in the parish. And so we're going to excuse your behavior. The church must never be a place where we hide and tolerate and collude by our silence. We should be a place that brings joy, that brings comfort, that brings security and safety to all. So that is my prayer for us, that we will encourage that in our lives together so that all may be safe. May God's peace be upon you as we work together for the good of all, not just the people who we love, not just the people who are related by blood, not just the people who we like, who speak like us, sound like us, dress like us, are different from us, or we deem to be different from us, but all God's children. Thank you very much, Fiona and Paul and your team. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. I wonder if you could just pray for us before we begin. Thank you. Thank you. Almighty God, you have made us in your image. And we are told that when you made us, when you created the, the world and all that is in the world, you stepped back, you looked, and you said, this is good. Thank you, Lord, for that affirmation. Teach us, Lord, to imitate your love, to imitate your kindness, to imitate the, the, the kind of way that you bring us in to the fold not with judgment, but with love. We thank you for those who are working in this field of safeguarding. And we pray that all your children will responsibly embrace what it means to care for one another in love. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, if we could, we would all applaud, but we can't. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm going to hand over without further ado to Paul now for his presentation. Thank you, Fiona. Um, 
Right, let's start. The elephant in the room, why we sometimes miss safeguarding. The presentation I'm giving today is one that I've wanted to do for a long time and focuses on an area of practice that is not usually discussed in the context of safeguarding. This is about how our brains sometimes let us down when we try to make sense of what is going on and make decisions based on wrong assumptions, even when our brains and thinking are behaving in the way that they are designed to. My interest in this area stems from my background in psychology prior to my career in social work, as well as my even earlier career as a graphic artist, where I frequently use techniques to present a 2D image as three-dimensional. Today is an opportunity for me to pull all of this together. I hope that you find this presentation interesting, informative and relevant to some of the challenges that we all face in, the, in our work safeguarding vulnerable people. Firstly, let's take a quick look at just how amazing our brains are. What we can see from this slide is just how complex brains are and also extremely efficient. IBM's artificial intelligence question and answer computer system called Watson uses 750,000 watts of energy compared to the 12 watts used by our brains. Our brains can also store about 2.5 petabytes of data. That's a lot of data. You would need over 4 million CD-ROMs to store that much. Our brains are also subtly different and reflect our own personal experiences. This is a visual schematic of my brain. And if you were to ask Fiona and Karen or Katie, they would all concur that a large part of it definitely seems to be dedicated to obscure sci-fi references. While computers are better at doing specific and well-defined tasks, the best computers can beat the best human chess players and solve complex mathematical equations that were previously unsolvable. One area our brains are much better at than a computer is tasks that cannot be modularized by an algorithm such as pattern recognition, language comprehension, common sense and creativity. This includes safeguarding, at least for now. This is one example of how the use of AI is being tested in social work to try to predict which children are most at risk. So far, it isn't doing very well. So let's now focus a bit more into how the brain processes information to make sense of the world around us. As you can see from the information on this slide, our brains do this very quickly and usually very effectively. It does this by using shortcuts in processing that are based on a set of rules that most of the time hold true. One exception is when we process sensory illusions. Sensory illusions are fascinating. They exploit one or more chinks in our brain's information processing systems and my next slides give some examples to help illustrate this. This illusion is called twinkling lights and works by overstimulating the eye's sensory cells, causing the illusion that the white dots change in brightness. This optical illusion is made up of a series of blue dots on a green background with white shading that varies in where it is placed around the dot. The illusion of movement happens because our, our, our eyes are only able to see fine detail in a small fragment of our visual field at any one time. This is the area of about the size of a honeybee. Our brains use a trick called saccades, quick automatic eye movements every two or three seconds to compensate for this. As your eyes jump from one dot to another, trying to stitch together a complete picture, your brain is confused by the alternate shading against each dot, which isn't where your brain predicts it should be from viewing the previous dot, creating the sense of motion. The same type of illusion is demonstrated in this image. Other types of illusion rely on how our brains make assumptions about depth, colour and shading. 
In this image, you have two vertical red lines that are perfectly parallel to each other, but your brain perceives them as being bent. This, is, this illusion is another example of, of how depth perception can influence the size of an object compared to its surroundings. Each of the human characters are actually the same size, but the illusion of depth created from the background behind them makes them look different sizes. If you don't believe me, try measuring each character with your finger. This image is made up of a series of circles and not a spiral. Again, if you don't believe me, these are circle. If you don't believe these are circles, try following one with your finger on your computer screen. And then clean off the smudge you have left on the screen from your chocolate covered fingers from that biscuit that you've been quietly eating during this presentation. If I was to ask you which orange dot in this image is bigger, you'd probably say the one on the right, surrounded by the smaller black dots. In fact, they are exactly the same size. This illusion is based on how our brains can create subjective colours, and a version of it was originally presented on a BBC Horizon programme in 1985. What I would like you to do is look at the dot at the centre of this image as I count up to 10. One elephant, two elephant, three elephant, four elephant, five elephant. I hope you're still looking. Six elephant, seven elephant, eight elephant, nine elephant. Most of you should have seen the Union Jack in its traditional red, white and blue as an after image. The illusion happens because our retinas contain three types of color receptors with different absorption spectra. When you stare at the original image, the cones responsive to each of the colors get tired out and respond less well when they would, than they would normally do to the white background once the image is taken away. But the cones for the other colors work normally, giving the after image. By the way, counting elephants is a very good way of keeping the time. Another area where you can create optical illusions is around shape recognition. Recognizing shapes is one of the hardest challenges our brains perform. Shapes can be moved, rotated, distorted, obscured, or even be different sizes and colors. Our brains deal with these challenges by using a toolkit of assumptions Sometimes, however, our eagerness to see shapes can also lead us to seeing them when none are present. Take, for example, the image in this slide. What you probably see is a white triangle overlapping a dark, darker triangle and three green circles below the white triangle, one at each of its corners. In reality, there is no white triangle or large dark triangle below it or circles, which becomes evident when the green circles are rotated. Our brain's predisposition to recognize the shape of a triangle and circles is so powerful that it fills in the blanks and even perceives the white triangle as being whiter than the background behind it. Our brain's obsession with shapes also happens with faces, hands, dogs, and even elephants. We are also primed to recognize letters and words. Take the following, which is a sentence with the lower half obscured. Yeah. Can okay. you work out what the sentence says? Yeah. If you said, I like jumping to conclusions, you were wrong. This illusion, can, uh, illusions can also be formed from cultural beliefs and assumptions. In this drawing, most people brought up in a westernized country would describe an indoor scene with a window. But if you were to show this image to someone who had grown up in a non-westernized country, they may well be more likely to describe an outside scene under a tree with one of the human figures balancing a container on their head. Our auditory 
sense can also be fooled by illusions. What I'm going to do is show you a short BBC clip that was part of another Horizon programme and describes one such auditory illusion called the McGurk effect. Before I show the video, I just need to make a slight adjustment to optimise the video and sound. You may see a slight reduction in the video quality, but it's needed to ensure that the video and sound synchronise. Have a look at this. What do you hear? Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. But look what happens when we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba. And yet, the sound hasn't changed. In every clip, you are only ever hearing ba with a B. It's an illusion known as the McGurk effect. Take another look. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. So um, the mouth movements we see as we look at a face can actually influence what we believe we're hearing. If we close our eyes, we actually hear the sound as it is. If we open our eyes, we actually see how the mouth movements can influence what we're hearing. Ba, ba, ba. It's a bizarre ba, effect. Ba, Remember, the ba, only sound you're hearing is ba, ba with a B. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba. What's remarkable about ba, this illusion ba, is even knowing ba, how it's done doesn't ba, seem to make a difference. Ba, ba. The effect works no matter how much you know about the effect. I've been studying the McGurk effect for 25 years now, and I've been the face in the stimuli. I've seen stimuli thousands and thousands of times, but the effect still works on me. I can't help it. Ba, 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 ba. The McGurk experiment shows us that even when our senses are working normally, we can still make mistakes in interpreting their signals. If this didn't come out well enough for you to see the effect, then you can watch this video clip and others on the McGurk effect on YouTube. What these illusions tell us is that what we see and hear and feel isn't under our conscious control. Even when we know what we are seeing or hearing is an illusion, our minds stubbornly refuse to budge. We need this automatic pre-processing to respond adaptively to our outside environment, but even when our brains are working in the way they are meant to, we can sometimes make mistakes. In the same way the brain uses shortcuts in how we perceive, we also use shortcuts in our thinking that are referred to as cognitive biases. There are many types of cognitive bias and this slide lists some of the more common ones. These mental assumptions allow us to make quick decisions without too much conscious thought, but they can lead to poor decision making. Each of us will be influenced by these types of cognitive bias in subtly different ways, depending on our personality, the level of social influence we're subject to, and our intelligence and knowledge. One area where cognitive biases is rule is the development and spread of conspiracy theories. This is a leaflet developed by the European Union to explain what conspiracy theories are and how they arise. It was published in response to the conspiracies about the coronavirus pandemic. Research is also helping to identify what types of personality traits and characteristics make people more likely to believe in conspiracies. And some of the findings are outlined in this slide. Other research also suggests that people with schizoid personalities may also be more vulnerable to believing conspiracy theories. This slide provides some examples of how common a belief in conspiracies are. 
with up to 60% of UK citizens believing in them. If you believe in a conspiracy theory, don't be too hard on yourself. As the surveys suggest, a lot of us probably believe in at least one. You never know. Some may well be true. Conspiracy theories are often just a bit of fun, but they are more worrying when they lead to people being harmed. One area where this is happening is with the COVID-19 virus. This uh, is one of many conspiracies that the coronavirus pandemic has generated. The circuit diagram is in fact an outline of the circuitry for a guitar pedal, but it's currently doing the rounds as the design of a microchip that has been added to the vaccines. Here are some more conspiracies about the virus. What is common with each of these conspiracies is the operation of at least two cognitive biases, proportionality and intentionality. This slide shows how these biases might operate in someone's thinking about how to make sense of the viral pandemic. Now let's focus on another very dangerous conspiracy theory that's being spread by far-right groups in the USA under the name of QAnon and which found a home in the presidency of Donald Trump. It began in October 2017 with an anonymous posting on an internet chat room called 4chan by someone referring themselves as Q. Q is presented as someone who is an official in the US government with Q level security clearance. Some of the followers believe this is Trump himself and refer to him as Q+. Q claims to have insider knowledge of the existence of a cabal of Satan worshipping paedophiles, including politicians, the media and Hollywood actors, who control everything and that had it not been for Donald Trump, they would have continued to be in control of America. The conspiracy goes on to say that Donald Trump is battling them leading to a day of reckoning referred to as storm, which will involve the mass arrest of the cabal leaders by the US military, a great awakening, salvation and utopia on earth. QAnon have also tried to influence the US presidential elections and are now a key voice in spreading conspiracies about the coronavirus, including that Bill Gates is responsible for it as part of a scheme to vaccinate the world. Many of the rioters involved in the storming of the US Capitol on the 6th of January are believed to be followers of QAnon, including the woman who was killed. This slide shows a number of different symbols and slogans used to advertise QAnon and their conspiracy. These include Follow the White Rabbit, which associates the conspiracy to the film The Matrix, and the choice the main character in that film, Nemo, has to make about choosing the blue or the red pill in order to see the truth or not. We go one, we go all is often abbreviated to WWG, one WGA. Trust the plan to save the world and storm is coming and the great awakening are other examples used by QAnon followers. These slogans can be found on t-shirts, badges, and other types of clothing, and a large number of the rioters at Capitol on the 6th of January were wearing clothes with these types of logos on them. You may well see people wearing them coming to your churches, and if so, this will help you understand what they mean. This is a photo of one QAnon follower, but not all who believe in all or some of the QAnon conspiracy are as easy to spot. They include people who have held positions of responsibility, such as in the police, fire service, military, local politics, and also an Olympic gold medalist. So how do these errors in our perception and thinking relate to safeguarding? Well, we, we don't see too many conspiracies directed at safeguarding per se, but what we may well see is vulnerable people attending church whose experiences and personalities 
may make them more vulnerable to believing conspiracies that could ultimately cause harm to them or others. Cognitive biases can also lead to serious errors of judgment and decision making by professionals involved in keeping people safe. One example of this concerns the death of Victoria Climbier almost 21 years ago. Victoria's death is one of the saddest examples of what can happen when mistakes are made safeguard. It's arguably one of the best examples of how cognitive bias and failures in decision making on a multi-agency level can lead to a failure to recognise abuse. In Victoria's case, 12 missed opportunities were identified in the child abuse inquiry, and these are listed in this slide. What becomes clear when you dig down into these errors is how many times instances of cognitive bias occurred. One of these was the assumption made by numerous professionals that the presentation of Victoria sometimes looking grubby and neglected was part of a ruse by her aunt to obtain better housing. This was an example of confirmation bias. Another example of confirmation bias and the rule of optimism in operation together concerns the very dangerous assumption just prior to Victoria's death that she and her aunt had moved back to France. There were also multiple examples of professionals failing to pick up the warning signs of abuse, including cuts and bruises, reflecting both the influence of the rule of optimism and failures in pattern recognition. Alongside all of this, a number of organisational deficits can be seen as latent contributors to Victoria's death. This includes failures in effective internal and multi-agency communication, poor supervision, large caseloads leading to staff burnout and stress. Even the office fax machine had a part to play. The failure of the social work to read a medical report thoroughly, which included comments on suspected abuse by the hospital doctor, was in part caused by a faulty fax machine that produced smudged documents that were difficult to read. One of the key messages that Victoria's death tells us is that uncertainty is a constant part of safeguarding. It pervades our knowledge of what has happened as well as what will happen. You cannot eliminate it, only reduce it. In the final analysis, decisions have to be made in a timely way, balancing the need to make decisions as quickly as possible, often using incomplete information in the knowledge that that may lead to error while also recognising that delaying a decision to reduce uncertainty may cause more harm. What I have presented today shows that sometimes, even though our brains are working the way they are designed to do, we are less the ideal model of thought and reasoning proposed by, De by Descartes, I think, therefore I am, and a bit more like by the sailor man. But understanding this and how errors are likely to occur gives an opportunity to learn and improve. The systems and processes that we have in place across the diocese are designed to ensure that the decisions that we make are the best ones possible. The important thing is to ensure that we don't make mistakes that are avoidable because we failed to follow processes designed to keep people safe and help us to recognise when our brain's instincts are getting it wrong. We're nearing the end of this presentation and I hope that what I have relayed to you hasn't put you off the great work that you do in your parishes across the diocese. So what about the elephants? I can hear you thinking. Is this presentation just another conspiracy, Mr Brightwell, to distract us from the plight of so many elephants in fear of extinction? That they are now hiding in our homes? If you think that, you can come and see me later for a chat. But what I would like to leave you with is one final task. To find the elephant hiding in the picture before the hunter spots him. You have 10 seconds.
For those of you that didn't spot the elephant in time, perhaps if I invert the picture, that might help. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoyed my presentation and found it useful. Thank you. Over to you, Fiona. Thanks, Paul. Um, were there were a couple of questions. I thought you had a couple of questions for the breakout room. Uh, yes, well, the, the, sorry, I sent them to you. I thought you were going to list the, qu the questions. Oh, the sorry, miscommunication. I thought you were just going to add that to the end of your, <laughs> your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you got them there? So uh, what, uh, while Paul's looking for his questions, I'm going to tell us what's happening next. So we are going to send you into breakout rooms to talk about the two um, as discussion of um, Paul's presentation and how it might relate to your parishes or the work that you do. Uh, and, uh, um, and he's got some specific questions that he'll just set you. We can't, um, I can broadcast them to the rooms anyway. So perhaps maybe we can do that. Um, and we'll do that for about 20 minutes. Um, and then we suggest you all take a break for 20 minutes um, and go and get a coffee and come back and we'll bring you back in for about 10.45. Um, if you have any questions arising out of your um, breakout room discussions, then please feel free again to pop them in the chat in capitals and we can uh, address those. Paul will do a Q&A session when we come back around 10.45. Have you got the questions there, Paul? I have, yeah. I'm just going to um, copy copy and paste them onto a Word document and then I'm going to share them so that Fine. they go up on screen. Okay, so just bear with us for a slight yes. second. Right. I might copy them. Into a, into a new this is when I feel like as a presenter you always want a backup plan and uh, but tap dancing is not really my bag and <laughs> I don't sing very well over zoom I'm afraid but um just bear that, with us no I won't do that that's fine <laughs> Right, here we go, nearly here. Okay. Right, I shall share, I shall share the screen. Right, okay. Here we go. Oh. Oh, that's a blank one, right. there we go. So the question is, how many instances can you think of where one or more of the following cognitive biases have occurred in your church on a safeguarding issue. And I've listed the cognitive biases as the common com cognitive biases is there that I presented in my slide. So if I just leave that up for a little while, you can um, just make a note of that or perhaps take a photo of it on, on the screen with your phone. As I said, we'll also broadcast that to the rooms as well once okay. you're in there, so you'll be able to um, to read them there as well. Okay. okay. Shall we stop sharing there, Paul, and I'll pop people into breakout rooms and then we can. So, as I said, um, 20 minutes roughly talking about the, those and discussions and then um, take a break for 20 minutes and we'll reconvene at 10.45. So I'm going to pause the recording. I think we're going to um, move on from there from the question and answer now. If we move on to um, the next bit of our program, which is um, just some sharing of some safeguarding updates. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so just bear with me while I do that. And again, I'm hoping that that's, you're all looking at the screen now that says safeguarding updates. And I will just, uh, there we go, that's better. Okay, so just a few things to draw your attention to. Um, and I'm hoping, I think some of you were asking some questions in the chat at the same time. So I'm hoping that um, 
I cover both of those. If you see me looking to the side, it's because I work off two screens. So I'm, I'm not <laughs> trying to ignore people. I'm just looking at what you're looking at over to the, my left hand side here. Um, so a couple of things to welcome. We need to welcome a few new people. Um, one you'll have already seen, Katie. Um, she's second on the list. That's by no way an indication of her importance or how we value her. It was just how I put the slide together. Um, and she's our new safeguarding trainer. She joined us in November and um, some of you will have had communication from her already um, and I know she'll be in um, communication with others going forward but um, just to welcome Katie to the team and um, Paul and, I, and myself and Karen greatly relieved when she joined in November to have a, a trainer back but also a trainer with Katie's skills and ability so it's really good to have her with us and also um, the, we have a new um, independent chair for the Diocesan and Cathedral Safeguarding Advisory Panel by way of Carol Idden. Um, the role of that panel is a strategic one to hold the diocese to account in terms of how it's managing its safeguarding um, and Carol chairs that and she's been a great addition to the team uh, just in terms of her vision. You can read up about her background but she um, is retiring at the end of this month as the um, Managing Director for Action for Children. So comes with a, a good knowledge of third sector work as well as um, safeguarding and having safe that kind of safeguarding hat at the forefront um, and being strategically minded as well. Um, and we had to say a few farewells as well this year. Um, so at the end of the year, David Kemp and Steve Lillicrap both stepped down as chair and vice chair of the Diocese and Safeguarding Advisory Panel and the executive group, um, handing over to Carol Idden. And the executive group is now being um, chaired by one of the archdeacons. And uh, we just wanted to acknowledge their departure and say thank you for all their time and effort and hard work. And um, one of the questions, which was posed in the chat, which I'll address later, is kind of the state of safeguarding within our diocese. Um, and I think Paul and I would say that it's it's in a, you know, well, you never want to rest on your laurels with safeguarding, but we would say that it is in a good place. Um, as for, from DSA point of view, we get quite a lot of contacts from people in the parishes from incumbents um, and um, and that safeguarding is quite high on people's radar and that is largely down to the work that the safeguarding team um, did under the direction of David Kemp, Steve Lillcrap and not forgetting Julian Hills as well who set it up in the first place and um, so we were sad to see all three of them go actually at the end of the year and just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you, uh, thank them personally for all the work, hard work um, and um, debate and discussion and I'm sure sweat and tears that went into some of those things as well and we also lost in well we didn't lose her but she left to go to the bishop's office sj martin at the beginning of july who was previously our trainer so a couple of new faces around um in terms of training um you'll be aware the clergy training um is ongoing but this is new um the national safeguarding team really have not rolled out any lay leadership training as yet so we have decided that um it's really too long a gap now to leave it any further um so katie has been developing um along with um just acknowledgement from the national safeguarding team that it's necessary um, a lay leadership training course um, and this will be for anybody who is in a leadership position and not um, but not licensed uh, not holding a licensed clergy ministry type license so it would exclude people like readers um, PTOs um, clergy because there is the clergy leadership training course um, but this is for anybody like ALMs um, particularly for church wardens who've got an incumbent if you're in an interregnum we'd recommend and you're a church warden we recommend you would do the, the licensed leadership course instead um, but anyone else um, this is, could be for worship leaders, it could be for children and youth leaders, anybody in a lay leadership role. Um, it's roughly being rolled out by area. It, it will not be face to face, as you can appreciate, we're still in a, a very a virtual world as a result of COVID. Um, so although the dates are there roughly available by area, and that's more for the sake of discussions, because it'd be good when you come to the discussion point to have discussions from people within your area or your own church but it's not limited to that so any course that you are able to get on there um, feel free to book yourself on um, the bookings are available through the diocesan website and through eventbrite um, if you are at a parish um, 
a safeguarding officer, um, you will need to locally keep a register of who has undertaken what training. Um, and please look to our website for the GDPR rules around how to keep that information and where to store it and how to keep it safe. But we, um, we won't be keeping a register. There's just too many people for us to do that for. Um, and if you have any questions about how often the training needs to be undertaken, it's roughly every three years. Um, but please do get in touch with Katie or Karen who can point you in the right direction if you have any questions in regards to the administration of that. And that would also apply to the um, online training available through the Church of England and uh, put on by the National Safeguarding Team. Um, we, we don't get a register of who's undertaken that you would need to keep that locally around who's undertaken what training. Um, so I've mentioned the license leadership training. Um, we also, um, those who need the license leadership training will be contacted by um, our offices um, and advised um, when that's due. We are um, in, in the communicating with the police or in discussions with the police about um, holding some county lines training which is um, uh, really relevant for a number of our parishes um, and we will let you know as and when we're hoping to make that quite widely available um, but information in regards to that when it's available will go out via the briefing um, and we may well send out a targeted email to those we feel that would benefit, for, um, benefit from that. I just wanted to touch on the ICSA report on the Church of England and safeguarding. Uh, if you want to read the full report, it is available on um, either the Church of England website or ICSA itself. It was published in October 2020. Um, there are some recommendations being that were made to the National Safeguarding Team and they are being implemented by way of working groups looking at the best way to implement those. Um, but it could well be some time before there are any changes felt on the grounds in terms of parishes. Um, a lot of the recommendations were for national structures anyway, um, not necessarily for parish level. Um, but just also wanted to make you aware that um, Canterbury, either myself and Paul and our um, independent chair are part of those those um, groups um, who are looking at the changes and having a bit of a voice and an influence on on which way the policy goes. Um, so it's always helpful to know that Canterbury's got a voice into those things. Um, and also wanted to just highlight this and this came out um, partly before ICSA but was recommended by them and noted by them. Um, there is something called Safe Spaces which is um, a free and independent support service providing confidential personal and safe space for anyone who's been abused through their relationship with um, the church or clergy member and it's been commissioned by the Anglican and Catholic churches in England and Wales. If you need um, information about how to access that feel free to get in touch or you can just google it and it's being run by um, the organisation called Victim Support so they've got quite a vast amount of experience in supporting victims of abuse or crime. And then uh, just finally, a couple of things, um, if you have any questions, and if you have any questions off the back of this conference, as I said, it's, it's really, there's too many um, people in the conference to allow a free for all of um, discussion, and we appreciate that. But if you've got any queries or questions afterwards, just um, contact us. All our contact details are available on our website. Um, and just a reminder of what our faces look like, just in case you'd forgotten <laughs> off the back of this. And Karen, uh, very adept at DBSs, so any questions in relation to that and training uh, over to Katie. And we just wanted to acknowledge, I know it's not the end of the conference, but before, you know, I wanted to say this before we get to that point, um, really just a big thank you to all of you who volunteer, who help, who have a mind to safeguarding within your parishes. It is um, as a result of your involvement and your commitment um, and so committed that you're here on a Saturday morning um, that our parishes are safer places um, than they might otherwise be. So really want to say a big thank you to all of you for giving up your time and energy. And, um, and it, we recognise that it doesn't, you know, um, things like this don't come at zero cost, even if you're volunteering, it comes at a personal cost of giving up of your time and your own energy. So thank you very much. So I'm going to stop sharing.
and I am now going to hand over to Katie. If you have any questions, again, just pop them in capital letters into the chat. And uh, while Katie's doing her presentation, if there's anything coming up, um, we can address that afterwards. But I'm going to hand over to Katie now, who's going to give us her talk on online safety. Okay, good morning. And I, I was just going to say it's wonderful to see how many of you are here today, um, but actually probably it would be fair to say it's wonderful not to see you because it makes it much easier for me to present, much less scary than a room full of people. So I am going to share my screen now. Who would have thought this time last year that the conference would be online like this? Right. As this is the world we're living in at the moment, we thought it would be a good idea to just go through a few points that are pertinent to the way we are running our churches at the moment. So at the moment, I suspect your churches are not looking like this, but a bit more like that. And so the question for all of us is, how do, does that change the way we think about safeguarding? Goodbye. All right. Talk to you guys Bye. soon. Bye. See you guys. Jen, call him. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm going to do that pants. Hey, honey, honey, honey. <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to text a couple of pictures of that. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. Oh. Yes. Oh boy. <laughs> What's up? Tony, I can see you here. We right can there. all see you. <laughs> Goodbye. All right. I nearly had my own moment just now when I forgot to mute my microphone when I popped to the loo, but uh, thankfully I remembered at the last minute. So, many of the principles for safeguarding good practice, of course, remain the same, and preparation is the key. You need to try to preempt issues and put plans in place to minimize risk, just as you would for any other church activity. For example, if you have any safeguarding agreements in place, you may need to think about updating these to include specific recommendations around online activity. I hope you can all read all of that, that you might need to move where the people's faces are on your screen. For those of you who've got activities going on with children online, you may need to consider some of these points. Right, I'm now going to look at Zoom, first of all, um, because although um, it's not the only platform out there. It is the one that a lot of us are using. Um, it doesn't really matter which platform you use, but just try to avoid a site such as um, Facebook, um, which potentially shares a lot of data. This cartoon is particularly pertinent to me at the moment. I, I hope you can't hear it, but there is a cat meowing loudly outside my door. It's easy to forget that through the power of technology, we're inviting other people, possibly strangers, into our homes. 
So we need to be aware of how exposed, sometimes literally, we're making ourselves by doing so. We're also potentially exposing other members of our household to risk. Think about where you Zoom. Make sure personal information isn't on display. Make sure other household members know you're on camera. I recently heard of a church Zoom that witnessed a family member on the hunt for a towel immediately following a shower. We can develop a full sense of security by getting to know people in the online world. And we need to apply the same rules we would use when we get to know people in the real world. So here are some top tips for Zooming. Hopefully you all know what Zoom bombs are. They're, they're um, thankfully less common now because of um, the use of the waiting room feature where people not invited to Zoom sessions um, come in and disrupt what's going on. It happened at the beginning quite a lot when people were using them in schools. So I'm now moving on to live streaming, which is another element of the online challenge for us in church. And this is one I found. How did I take my hat off for this drama? Just keep on going. Like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. So open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river. So I'm not sure how many of you have entered the world of live streaming, um, but I think it's one of those things that we've done as a, a re reactive measure to what's been going on in the world. And we need to perhaps step back a little bit and think about safeguarding from the point of view of live streaming and think about how we ensure that we keep members of our congregation safe. Now this whole online lark has meant that we've all had to become experts fairly quickly. I'm just going to show you a picture of somebody who didn't fully understand the use of filters. Oh, oh, sorry, I forgot there was one more, one more slide here. Yeah. Unfortunately, this chap kept these googly eyes on for the whole of his service. Now, whilst we're thinking about the safety of our congregations that are joining us online, I think it's also important to remember that not everybody is able to do so. And we have to think about how we support the rest of our congregations. And I'd like to give you a few minutes now to just discuss in your breakout rooms what it is that you are doing in your church. First of all, what are you doing to keep your church going in these times? What online and offline activities are you offering? But I'd also like you to think about 
any safeguarding implications that this might have. Right, Fiona, I'm going to hand over to you to, to put people into the breakout rooms, if that's okay. Yep, we'll right. just be going in for about 15 minutes, that's all. So 15 okay. minutes and I'll open the rooms now. Okay. I, I apologise if there are any problems during my session. Typically, when you're talking about the problems that can go wrong with Zoom, I lost my... Um, my my AirPods stopped working halfway through, so I wasn't sure. I couldn't hear any audio at all, and I couldn't. I didn't know whether you could hear me, so um, it's typical. Right, I'm going to finish off with a little clip here that you may have seen previously. Well, welcome back to the last part of our online worship experience from St Judah Parish Church. The last section we call waiting, and it's a great thing to pause in the presence of God and to ask the question, Lord God, what are you saying to us? And then, of course, to wait for an answer. Uh, I've just been pausing uh, between these. Oh dear, I just caught, caught fire. <sighs> oh my word. Well, I hope you're still on fire for Church Online and I haven't extinguished your spark of enthusiasm. Like it or not, it's our present and our future. And as long as we apply the usual safeguarding procedures to this new context and remain proactive rather than reactive, we can minimise the risks and enhance the benefits of ministering in a virtual world. I would just like to say, I am sure during your discussions you came up with lots of you may have had questions, but you may also have come up with some wonderful ideas. I'm sure there's all sorts of fantastic things going on around the diocese. Um, it would be really nice if you could share some of those wonderful ideas in your chat as well, um, so that we can make them more widely available. Uh, right. Thank you very much. And back to you, Fiona. Thanks, Katie, and um, thank you for that presentation. I know, um, Rachel, I just want to acknowledge your comment in the chat about um, the increased um, cases of safeguarding that nurseries and schools are dealing with, and you're right. Um, there is, th that is definitely certainly going on in the uh, churches and nurse, um, schools and nurseries around. And I think um, also um, there's been an increased awareness of domestic violence and domestic abuse going on in homes um, that has been previously hit, well, it's been hidden, but actually that um, the current lockdown and the previous lockdowns are contributing to as well. And issues in mental health. I think there's been um, lots, you know, there was a comment earlier in the chat about, um, you know, acknowledging that after lockdown and sort of as we start going into the recovery and reconstruction phase of this crisis because um, at the moment we're still in the response phase of the crisis but as we move forward that we will need to be acknowledging um, you know people's mental health their emotional well-being um, and it may be something that we look to but I think as churches um, it will be something that will you'll be increasingly aware of within your own context about how folks in your community have or have not been able able to manage um, the ongoing stresses and pressures. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we are, I'm just checking if there is, doo -doo -doo. Um, somebody's making a comment about Lorraine from The Living Well about just letting people know in Zoom or similar technology in advance if you're going to be visible to others. So um, unlike live streaming, so if you record it that they are happy for their um, images to go out and that's a very good point and um, David also about lockdown creating further vulnerabilities um, and for those unable to access technology and parishes thinking about their contact lists and how they adjust those to cater for that as well so just important to, to remember all of those points going forward. Um, I'm happy to report that we are an hour ahead of schedule uh, for the conference.
Um, and as a result of that, um, we, uh, well, not as a result, but actually I'm going to invite Bishop Rose to just give some final comments. You have to bear with us. We, we sort of anticipated timings and seeing how it would go. And um, we've given you an extra hour on your Saturday morning. And um, before Bishop Rose um, just speaks to us finally, I just wanted to say thank you all for coming and for making time this Saturday. I know again, I've thanked you once, but I wanted to say again, you know, my, our job from a dialogue and safeguarding perspective would not be possible without the eyes and ears on the ground um, and we can't be in all you know of the over 200 parishes that exist within the diocese so it's down to volunteers and folks like yourselves and um, bringing things to our attention and and raising issues that means that our diocese is a safer place to be so I wanted to say thank you once again but I'm going to invite Bishop Rose just to make some concluding remarks and pray for us just before we finish. Again, may I add uh, Fiona's uh, thanks to everyone for giving up this time for us to be together as we reflect on how do we ensure um, that the spaces we are in together is safer for everyone, um, and, and in particular those who are most vulnerable in our communities. Uh, Paul, I want to thank you especially for enabling us to, to look at a wider picture of where things are coming from, and in particular, looking at our biases and recognizing that how we see things, how we view certain situations, others looking at that may also be looking through different lenses and that we come to these things uh, um, with a lot of cultural, a lot of cultural biases. Uh, I was wondering also when we showed the slide of uh, Columbia, the little girl, what other things were going on in the minds uh, of those who are meant to be offering real care and, and seeing the vulnerability of this child instead of looking through a particular lens and making assumptions uh, which meant that her needs uh, were never really met. All of us uh, in all our differing capacities, whether it be ordained or lay, have a responsibility as the people of God to ensure that the environment in which we operate in is safe and friendly in a real in a real way not hostile so that everyone can feel when they walk into our churches our online screens that they are being received for who they are children of god and not for any labels that society or the world may put on them. So I hope we've all gained something. And, and, and I'm personally going to be re-looking again at uh, Paul's contribution to make sure that I can fully embrace, appreciate, understand, and put into action what I have learned from this morning. So thank you all again for your patience, for your time, and for your willingness to engage in this area of safeguarding. I wonder if we could just have a moment stillness. And in that stillness, we will hear a bit of scripture and after that there will be prayer so let's just be still for a moment
I'm sure you have heard the term uh, dwelling in the word. And uh, the, at the senior staff team, we have been looking repeatedly at Isaiah 42. So I share some verses from that passage with you now. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. Let us pray. In our prayers, let us thank God for his many blessings. Let us thank God for the people we serve in our communities. Let us thank God for the people who have joined us online, for the people who walk in through our open doors. And let us ask God to lay on our hearts his mercy, his love, his compassion, his forgiveness, and his joy as we reach out to one another in a spirit of openness. in a spirit of embracing one another, in a spirit of lifting each other up before God. And let us ask that God will give us the wisdom to know when to let go of ourselves and let God, the Holy Spirit, have its own way in our lives and in our communities. Let us pray for Fiona and Paul and all the team in safeguarding in our diocese, and nationally. Let us pray for wisdom 
and understanding in the various tasks and cases presented to them. And let us pray that through God's Spirit, we might always be able to work side by side and hand in hand for the sake of the kingdom. So we say together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you. And all those whom you love, pray and care for this day and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rose. Well, that is the end of our conference. Um, we will keep um, the video going for a little while. Um, if you want to pop something in the chat, that's fine. But um, feel no pressure. Feel free to go. Thank you very much for attending, and we look forward to seeing you or speaking to you soon. And um, thank you. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs>